Hello and welcome to the Franco Nudic session. I would like to introduce you to my fellow colleague, Stefan Bender from Film France. Please, Stefan. Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to be here with you. I'm Stefan Bender. I'm CEO of Film France, the French National Film Commission. We are the French Film Commission who provides all the services to all the production who want to film or to produce something in France. And we also give information about the tax rebate for international production. I have, and I have the great pleasure to be here today with Teja Raninen. Thank you, Stefan. So I am Teja Raninen and I'm representing today Nordic Film Commissions. So we are 15 national and regional film commissions from Norway, Finland, Sweden, Iceland, Denmark, and islands Greenland, Faroe, and Orland. And we are so happy here with our wonderful speakers. And, and on behalf of uh, film commissions, as Stefan said, we are here to help you. We know our own production companies, our producers, and also the local services. So we can be a lot of help to you. But now to our speakers. Hello, I'm Sébastien Aubert from France. So I've got a company based in Cannes called uh, Adastra Films. And, and the reason why I, I am in this panel is because I recently produced a film called Girls Room by a Finnish director called Eino Suni. And this is a film that we mainly shot in France, partly in Finland and partly in Germany. And I was the, the, the lead producer in it. I am Jean-François Lecor, CEO of Vive Mon Lundi. We are a French company based in Brittany, in the western of France. And we produce animation and documentaries for 22 years now. And uh, I am the happy French minor co-producer of the Danish uh, animated documentary Flea by Jonas Poer Rasmussen, produced by Final Cut for Real in Copenhagen. And we won three awards and the Crystal Award at uh, ANSI's uh, Animation Film Festival. And it was a great, great moment. Hello, my name is Crystal Carlsen. I work at Nordic Film in Copenhagen. And uh, we do a lot of co-productions around uh, Sweden, Norway, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and France, of course. And last autumn, we did a co-production with First Step in France, uh, shooting a Danish feature film called Rose. Hi, uh, I'm Håvard Vetland Gosse. I'm a producer in Spat Film um, from Trondheim in uh, Norway. And uh, we've been doing documentaries and, and fiction for uh, 15 years uh, almost. And um, just now we are co-producing a French documentary series that is filming here in Norway. Um, I'm actually in the same area right now uh, as they are filming. What could be interesting to introduce this session about the cooperation and the, the way of working together would be to speak about the language. Crystal. Was the language an issue? Was it a barrier when you were starting to think about shooting in France for a rose? Uh, no, not at all. I think that uh, the French people, everybody speaks uh, English now, not like it used to be, <laughs> but uh, it's so easy to communicate. And uh, I think that everybody from the French team uh, could, could speak with our crew. So no, not an, not an issue at all. I also think the cultural barrier was, uh, oh, there wasn't any cultural barrier. It was um, so easy to be around the French crew. Can I jump in? Yeah, I, I kind of yes, agree please. on that. Uh, the, all the head of uh, positions, they all speak English properly. Maybe we have a bit more issues with assistant grip, assistant uh, electrician. There was part of the crew that hardly speak English and the DP was Finnish. Uh, but the head of departments, they were speaking English properly. Now, the, the main issue we had uh, language-wise was at post-production stage, when we had the rough cut, then the second cut, then the third cut, and every time, because the film is mainly in French, it was very, it was impossible for my co-producers to understand the film. <laughs> so we had to do internal subtitling, but the same applied to us, because some parts were in German and Finnish that I couldn't understand myself, so there was a long, we wasted some time in kind of doing the subtitles internally to, so that everyone understands and is on the same page all the time. So I would say that would, that was the only little uh, constraint with the language. I can, I can only agree to the, what is being said, uh, that this, um, it was the written part that was the, the mm. challenge. 
I, I co-produced for 15 years now with partners in Europe, but I was more used to work with uh, French speaking territories as Swiss mm -hmm. and Belgium. And to be honest, at the beginning of the development, I was a bit afraid not to be fluent enough in English. But uh, we spent five years on the development and the production, and I had a lot of time to improve my English during this <laughs> long period. Are we now more open to other languages when we talk about the, the language of the film? Because I, as a Finn, uh, have this feeling that maybe 10 years ago, it might have been a little bit difficult for a Finnish producer with Finnish speaking film, for example, to get a French producer on board. In my case for Flea, what helped us to reach French partner, especially Arte France, it is that Final Cut for Real, the Danish company was really famous on the international uh, uh, market for documentaries. They produced two big, big movies by, um, uh, I don't remember the name, but it was a look of silence at the act of killing. And mm -hmm. both documentaries were nominated for the Oscars and it helped us. But it's not, it's more a problem of uh, the number of competitors on the French market. When you go to funds, when you go to broadcaster, when you try to reach this budget, you have so many French producers that try to reach them that it's sometimes difficult when you work with another partner, especially when it's not a French speaking partner to rise the, the, these funds. But uh, what helped us too is that the contents, the movies coming from your area are now really popular, especially with fiction. Uh, everybody in France knows who, what is Borgen, for example. <laughs> The Norway's uh, TV dramas or fictions are really popular, especially with a channel as Arte. And at, in my opinion, at this time, it's not a real problem because if you want to dub, it's easy to dub. For documentaries, sometimes it can be a problem. In my opinion, it's more difficult for documentary, especially when it's uh, immersive documentary, what you, it's difficult to dub for <laughs> historical subjects, topics, or science it will be different. You will make a French version. For a, an immersive documentary, then you have to keep the feeling and the language. Sometimes it can be a handicap, but things are changing. Thank you. What about Crystal? I think there's so many international series being made now in, in their own language and everybody screen, uh, sees it on Netflix or HBO or whatever. I don't think it's a problem at all. Um, I love to watch French movies. I have a 14 year old son who wants to see all the French series they show <laughs> on the Danish television. And I, I just think it's really nice that um, we can see uh, Finnish, Swedish, Danish, French movies, whatever. Yeah, I think there's been a, a turning point with Casa del Patel and Narcos and, you know, this Netflix TV shows and Dark, the German. Yeah, I think there's been like a before and an after that. Um, and uh, talking also what I've been advised when we were starting Girls' Room is to avoid to have too many languages because in the, in the beginning, the film could be uh, one third uh, English, one third Finnish, one third French and sales companies, everyone told me you have to be very careful with that. It would be like a, a, a mess to understand for the market. So we decided to mainly do it in French. I think now people become more open and maybe now to have a mix of different languages could be more acceptable, I have no idea. But also in Denmark, we never dubbed the movies. And I guess it's the same in Sweden and Norway, when in France you have dubbed and in Germany they dubbed the movies. I just think it's so great to see the films in their original language. Do you have a comment on this, Howard? Uh, well, w when I was growing up, we were really uh, used to seeing Swedish, Danish and Finnish series on, on TV. And then for a while, it was everything was um, Norwegian and English. So I'm, I'm happy that we are now getting more languages. The four of you made co-productions. We're going to jump to the subject of co-production and how to find a co-producer, because this is something that is very important. With Jean-Francois, how did you find yourself involved in, in FLE? It started five or six years ago, and uh, it's a question of network, because the team that developed the project, FLE, as an animated feature documentary, is Final Cut for Real, a documentary a specialized company and Sun Creature Studio, an animation studio in Copenhagen. And the woman in charge of production is a friend of mine. And uh, five years ago, 
She told me, about, I have something strange, an animated documentary. We are looking for a partner who would like to work with friends. Could you be interested in that subject? And I read just two pages. One year after, I was at the MIFA in Annecy, and Charlotte de la Gournerie showed me the first screener, more than one minute, and it was amazing. It was uh, something really uh, powerful. All the concept was understandable with this only teaser. And I said, OK, I go, I sign. And it was like a dream after, because three months after, we had a first meeting in Paris, in Arte France. And at the end of the meeting, we had a, 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 development, a, a development contract. And it's really rare, after one meeting, to have this kind of uh, involvement of this uh, channel. And after, of course, the support of Arte helped us to become a strong French partner because with the support of the channel, we raised all the French TV support money at the CNC and after in two regions in French. Oh, wow. How did you get involved? Was it by network as well? Uh, yes, it was. Or firstly, I guess it was because um, the French team are looking to film in my region where I live. So... Uh, that is um, a good starting point. Um, so they were kind of searching in my area. And then we, uh, we started uh, talking. This was a couple of years ago. Um, and we were lucky to get some development funding from our local film fund. And so through this uh, half year with uh, this development, we came to know each other. And uh, they sent the amount of money that they had to send to us. So it kind of every, everybody but they trusted each other. Then COVID came along and the project was postponed for a year um, until we eventually got production funding as well. So gradually getting to know each other uh, story. Yeah. Same kind of story that happened to you, uh, Crystal, because the script was containing friends. Yes, exactly. Um, part of this is about these two sisters who goes to uh, Paris in a coach uh, 20 years after the, the, the oldest sister used to live in France and now she has a mental disease and she revisiting all these places um, and um, so we had to shoot like two weeks in, in, in Paris and first we contacted these two Danish uh, women we know in France who are also producers there but uh, they said with this kind of uh, locations you're going to shoot at you have to, to get a real professional co-production company in France that's why we contacted uh, First Step because they could get all these permissions for these very difficult locations where we were shooting at Versailles and uh, Dom des Invalides and Monet's Garden, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so they helped us with uh, all this, these things. And uh, for us, it's the tax rebate we get from France. That's why we're shooting there. And uh, Sebastian, you were the lead producer. So the challenge was not the same. You, you yeah. had to find co-producers. Uh, actually, uh, yes and no. Actually, the, the how did we come up to work with uh, Finnish directors? Because we discovered uh, short films in Clermont-Ferrand and we had like a big crush on them and we distributed them because at the time we were a short film distributor. And every, t every year in Cannes, we were having like a private screening to show the short films we distribute. I invited Aino, the director, and once she was there, I told her, by the way, since we're also producer, what about you come up with a story that could take place in the French Riviera? And she thought about it for a couple of years. Then she came back to us, and then we've developed the project together. But since day one of the of the project, there was a co-producer, a, a producer attached, a Finnish producer that produced our short films. So it was really like a co-development. And after two years that we have the script and the first amount of money, then we decided we, that we needed like a third co-producer. And uh, the German co-producer came because my business partner was in the jury of a festival in Austria with this co-producer called Frau Kökob Müller. And when we met her, we had like a, a professional crush and uh, we had our dream team of producers. And I always try to create like bonds, human bonds before making like just talking professional. Um, also training programs are great, like EAV or Transatlantic Partners or ACE. I mean, it's a fantastic opportunity to meet co-producers because it's, uh, you create bonds, you have activities, you listen to pitches, of course, but you also go get drinks. and So that's really a nice atmosphere to make friends. And then if the friendship is there, then to develop it into a, pro a professional relationship. 
is it so that it's e always easier, for example, in France, uh, is it easier to look for uh, a co-producer from Paris or is it uh, sometimes even easier to look uh, from somewhere else than uh, the capital region? What, what do you say about France? Yes, 85% of uh, the cinema and TV activities are centralized in Paris and the big area around Paris. And you have now 13 regions in France that have funds If you work on fiction, on TV fiction or uh, fiction for cinema, most of the partners are on Paris and the big area around Paris. For animation, you have now main studios, a lot of studios outside Paris and big, big studios in Valence, in Marseille, in uh, uh, Grand Est, Région Grand Est, close to around Strasbourg. Uh, In, in Lille, in Pictanovo, you have, which is a kind of regional agency, you have a very, very powerful fund with 3 million euros to spend in animation production. Then things are changing, but we have to know, you, partners have to know that all the distributors and all the broadcasters are based in Paris or around Paris. For producers or co-producers, it's now a bit changing and in a good way, in my opinion. Thank you so much. So now we will we'll, uh, turn the question into a very, very important topic, and that's financing. And um, on behalf of the Nordic countries, I, I can say that we almost all have the 25% cash rebate and all national and regional financing available. Sebastian, uh, did you utilize the, the Finnish cash rebate when you were shooting the, the film? No, no, we haven't because we shot only three days in Finland. Okay, yes. So we could have, and uh, there was the temperate uh, tax rebate also that we could have access, but it was such a small amount for so much paperwork okay. that we haven't gone into this direction. But we managed to have access to the French tax credits, which is pretty rare in the frame of co-production because um, the conditions are pretty drastic. So of course, you need to pass the European test, which is easy, but then the French test, which mm -hmm. is a bit harder, but More importantly, when you try to get the French tax credit, you need to have two thirds of expenses in France. You, you are not allowed to shoot in a studio outside of France and you have to spend the main uh, part of the post-production in France. Uh, and it's not always extremely clear in the guidelines. Uh, mm -hmm. There is the, what we call jurisprudence on some uh, aspects. And because it was the first time we created such a financing plan, we always almost did some mistakes. So we have to uh, repatriate a part of the post-production back to France. But uh, it's, it's possible to access the French tax credits uh, in such conditions. And of course, we have regional funding. The Région Sud has been very active uh, to support international co-production. They recently mm -hmm. developed like a, a co-production, international co-production development support. Uh, and then for production, they, they, they are very much uh, happy to support such project as long as you have like a French a local regional producer. On FLEE, we didn't use tax credit. Our strategy was to reach automatic funds and selective funds. And we decided to have a kind of hybrid strategy because of the co-production with Arte France. In Denmark, Norway and Sweden, it's, uh, um, the movie has a cinema agreement. In France, it's a TV agreement. Because of the amount uh, of the support of RT, it was possible to reach uh, a, a global budget of 1 million euros with this support. We had our regional fund in Brittany, Bretagne Cinema, who spent 140,000 euros. They agreed us to apply, not as a documentary, but as a TV drama, to have a better support, third time, biggest than if it has been uh, applied as a documentary. And we always uh, worked with that. Sometimes it was a documentary, sometimes it was, it was a TV drama to reach this uh, French part of uh, 950,000 uh, uh, euros for the French part. And the last thing, of course, because we were with French, Swedish, Danish, Norwegian, and German with RT France, we had the support of Creative Europe TV distribution, mm -hmm. and it was a big success. Do you want to comment on the financing, Howard? Yes. Uh, so for this documentary, we uh, were relying on the local fund 
here in my region. Um, which also answers another question that was uh, asked uh, previously. What does it matter or is it important to find a producer from the capital? My question, my answer is no, <laughs> because uh, um, we have access to both the Norwegian uh, uh, Film Institute and also the local fund. So please come to the regions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree because I'm not from the capital. <laughs> So I have another question. Uh, what about uh, the context of Franco-Nordic productions? What kind of markets or forums are the most interesting? Uh, well, in general, uh, Norway is trying to get into France as a, uh, as a market these days. So the Norwegian Film Institute is really encouraging us producers to find uh, French uh, productions to co-produce. So uh, we are looking to France as a market, if, um, if that answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yep. What about Christel? Oh, I would love to do some more productions in uh, France, but I think in general in Denmark we shoot uh, more and more all over Europe, so it's not only France, but uh, definitely a place I would like to come back to because I think it's so easy to uh, to work together and uh, and a beautiful place. Yeah, I remember yesterday you said that the the culture in France and in the Nordic countries is quite the same. So it is easy to, to cooperate. Exactly, yeah, I think that uh, the Nordic countries and France has a lot of similarities uh, in, in a cultural, cultural way, but of course we have differences, but just uh, talking together and laughing and it, working is so easy with the French people. Thank you. And Sebastian, uh, what do you say about uh, working with the Nordics? How has it been? First of all, before answering that, uh, just to jump back on your previous question about yes. the markets and, and forums, yes. there was one that really made a big difference to us was Baltic event in Tallinn. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, because and we won uh, the Eurimage Award there. So it was the first like very big support, European support we received. And then also Finnish Film Affair in Helsinki has been like yeah. very uh, helping us a lot. So, yeah. So, and to go back to your second question <laughs> about the, the difference. So, I, so, first of all, I have only one experience huh, on one film. So I can't make like general opinion, like if it always worked with all Scandinavian and French co-productions. Mm -hmm. But what I realize is that the, the, having some free time is, is a key element for the, for, for the artists that I worked with. You know, in France, on my uh, films with French uh, director, uh, they work on weekends, they work overnight, and sometimes they arrive at the shooting and they're exhausted. And I felt that with my director and her DP, they were both Finnish, they really managed the time of rest and they really insisted to get some time of rest because I had the tendency to always come back to them with questions and tasks and meetings. And, they re and I think it was very healthy for them to do that. In the beginning, I was a bit upset, but uh, <laughs> at, at the end, I think they were right. And it maybe made me change also my way of considering the time of rest that uh, a director and, and his crew need to have. And, and then I also felt that the, there is no really verticality, that the hierarchy is much more, maybe more a bit more horizontal. Mm -hmm. And we are much more in the dialogues. I, I really saw... Uh, because in France, especially in South of France, we're a bit Latin, so sometimes we raise the voice and we and we can uh, we can assess what we think uh, strongly. But in Finland, it's, it was pretty much of a quiet environment. This is how yeah. I felt. <laughs> so so maybe it's very cliche what I say, and again, I can't judge just after three days there. But uh, but yeah, it was my initial feeling. But okay. and, and, and extremely professional, you know. I, I will not quote some countries with which it's very hard to work, but with uh, my Finnish co-producer, it was extremely rigorous, uh, methodic, and uh, it was really a pleasure to work to work with her. Nice to hear. Mm. Uh, Howard, what about markets and forums that are most interesting for the franco nudic productions? Uh, sorry, I'm mid in the middle of a mos mosquito uh, no. <laughs> attack here. I'm producing a feature film these days uh, where we are talking with a French uh, co-producer um, and that project had a lot of interest in Eastern Europe uh, markets. So, yeah. the, uh, so the, um, the Cottbus market, for example, yes. that is the German market um, 
looking for Eastern Europe uh, project. That was that was really good. What about Jean Francois? Oh, it's very difficult for me to answer to this question, but uh, for Flea, uh, MIFAS, the, the, the market for uh, of ANSI's uh, animation film festival, yes. was really important because the first pitch was there in 2015, and the, the, the project won a first award that created a, form, a first authority for the project. And we came back uh, two years ago for a work in progress, which was really important to create a second way uh, of notoriety for, for the project and to prepare the application to festivals. That was really important. And as you know, ANSI is the biggest international event for animation. Mm -hmm. And uh, after we applied to Cannes and to Sundance, and mm -hmm. we had both selection and we won in Sundance. I would like to work again <laughs> with uh, uh, Denmark and I would like to work with Norway because we have a uh, uh, Norway, Norwegian have this uh, stop motion culture that we, we like. For, for, for that, it's only tax rebate or, yeah. or tax credit. <laughs> yeah. And when you have to share the work, it's not so easy when you don't have selective funds. That's one thing. And the other thing is the amount of pre buys uh, with the broadcaster in your countries. Sometimes it's a bit too weak when you are low to French amount. Or now, of course, that we all try to reach the, the, the platforms that can spend a lot of money to buy exclusivity, of course, but to buy a, a, a program. And about the culture, I totally agree with Sebastian. The, the, the schedule for a day or for a week are different, but for us, the pre-production was so good and so well prepared between all the members of the co-production that it was not a problem during the production phase. And we didn't lose any day uh, during the production phase. And that because we had this very important pre-production and we solved all the problems before entering production. Maybe you could give your opinion as well on this uh, organization uh, question, Crystal, because you shot with a, with a Danish crew, you shot in France, so you had to, to work with French people. So did, as, um, did it happen, as Sebastian said, that uh, you, you have less hierarchy among the crew that, than that what it is in France? How, how, how was it combined? And uh, how, was, how, was the, how was the communication made between your both crews? I think it's almost the same in Denmark as in France. Uh, I didn't experience that. Um, I think actually it was not flat both places, but I think mainly it's because of the production in uh, the French company, the way they uh, knew people, they knew all the crew they hired really well. So they had such a good tone between them. And I think um, they had very good communication also with the Danish crew. Uh, so I, I thought it was so easy, honestly, it was such a good experience, I should say something, but uh, honestly, no, it was just um, uh, well organized, I don't think we didn't have as much uh, prep time as I would have preferred because our director just came from a TV series in Ireland and was delayed because of COVID, so we had very short prep, prep but it just went so smooth, uh, everything, so... Someone mentioned that it was uh, there was a big difference between the head of departments and the assistants, but um, actually it's because in Denmark you're allowed to add an additional fee if you um, have a key function. So actually I think when I looked into the French wages it's almost the same as in Denmark. And also the hours we work is almost the same. So I think that made it really easy to work together during a day because we're used to the same amount of hours. Uh, our project is uh, it's not uh, so very big. It's um, it's uh, just two assistants from from Norway um, together with the DOP and the director, um, but they are working really good together. Uh, and of course, with such a small crew, they get almost friends, and they are staying here uh, hiking around for almost a month. But I feel that we had a good understanding from the start, anticipating the same things as I saw it. I, I have nothing negative to say on my part either. I guess we have been uh, both lucky and, and professional, all of us, in this talk. Can I just mention one thing about, um, the, the, I think the big difference between the Dan Danish crew and the French crew is uh, the amount of people. Uh, in general, in Denmark, we have very few people on the crew, maximum around 
30 or 40. That's a big, 40 is a big crew. Where in uh, France it, and other European countries I've worked in, it easily gets around 60, 70 or 80 people. Like in the art department, you would have um, uh, like an art director and he would have lots of assistants in France and in Denmark, he, the art director would only have two or three assistants. I think that sometimes may, like makes it more expensive to shoot in in uh, in Paris, but I also understand why because at the film we shot it was very uh, difficult location, so it, of course it had to be more crew. But in general, I think that's a big difference. So we have a question uh, about the contracts uh, in different countries. In Norway, we are um, uh, quite used to uh, short contracts, which I have met. Uh, uh, challenges with uh, in other countries like the US and, and other places um, and in the case of our core production with, with France um, uh, I was the one that came up with the draft for the core production agreement um, and it sounds like they uh, found it okay because we didn't have too much discussions about it but then again we were a, a small documentary um, but I was wondering when it comes to fiction films or, or bigger projects, um, uh, if you have uh, the French producers have uh, experienced uh, kind of challenges with negotiation or discussing uh, contracts with the Nordic partners. I think we, we, we work in three stages. I think we first had like a co-development deal because as I said earlier, my Finnish co-producer started the project in the same time as I was. So we had a co-development deal where we had each of us to write this amount of money. I, I don't remember the terms exactly. But. And then we have a deal memo that was a fa four or five pages. And then we had like a proper co-production agreement, maybe 20, 30 pages, something like this, in which we included our third co-producer. You, you're mentioning uh, page numbers here, and that's quite yeah. a long contract yeah. as I hear it. So, yes. And it's very important because... In my previous uh, projects, when it was smaller projects or short films or very indecent films, I was using templates. And now I decided really to hire like a, a, a lawyer specialized in European co-production. Hmm. It makes all the difference because he has, he anticipates everything. And that was like a time saver and a, an energy saver for me. What I can share with you at this time, I'm working with Belgium both territories, Flemish speaking and French speaking, and with uh, a co-production with four countries in Central Europe. And all the co-production or co-development deal or contracts are quite the same. What is really different is the contract for the authors in France. In France, we have very complicated uh, deals with the authors with now a big cultures of agents who are defending, and that's normal, the rights of their clients. But uh, generally, when I, I, I present this kind of contracts with international partners, they are surprised to discover contracts are, are between 30 and 40 pages <laughs> with all the exploitation, primary, secondary, remake, spin-off, uh, cultural exploitations, and that's very complicated. And when you enter when a French partner enters to a co-production, of course, he has to put all these elements to the main contracts with the partners. And this kind of uh, French specificity, specificity can uh, create more complexity during the negotiation of the last co-production contract. But at the beginning, for the, all the deal memos or development or pre-production deals, it's quite the same in the other countries. And for FLEA, uh, a private uh, American investor enter the production at the end. <laughs> it was a more complicated negotiation <laughs> that we all had. The Danish partner spent six months to, 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 sign, to, to negotiate and to sign the deal because you have to renegotiate with every partner involved in the co-production before to arrive to the last version of this deal with the American partner. So we can conclude that it's much easier here in Europe. Totally. So yes. we can cope with these agreements. <laughs> yeah. yes. my, my thing, I, if, before to conclude, I would add something about the model uh, of your countries in the Nordic area. Uh, I discovered it the last five years and it's a real inspiration for me 
because you have this uh, relationship with all the Nordic countries, the smallest as Finland. Finland uh, for the area of inhabitants is my city <laughs> to the biggest Sweden. And you have now this uh, history of uh, co-production, co-development, reciprocity that is really important between small and biggest countries. And that's really inspiring. Uh, we try now to, to, to enter into this kind of network with the Celtic countries, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, Brittany and Galicia. And it's not so easy to create. Congratulations for that, because when we started, we discovered how it worked between all your countries. And it's really powerful with a specific fund, the Nordisk Film Fund, the Nordisk Panorama. You created all the tools for this co-production that is really inspiring for me. Thank you very much to our audience for having being with us for this Franco-Nordic session. And I would like to uh, thank you, our wonderful speakers. Thank you so much. I think that your, your experience was wonderful and I hope that it was inspiring to all the listeners. And I would also like to thank all the organizers who made this session uh, happen. So thank you very much and uh, hopefully see you soon.